It looks like we've now lost our slides. Let's do that again. Okay. So uh, welcome everybody um, to um, this webinar uh, called Batman, the Online Clinical Classroom. Uh, my name is Elaine Huber and I'm going to be the moderator of the session today. And um, I'm currently a member of the Ascolite Executive and I'm assisting the usual Ascolite Live webinar master <laughs> um, organise this today. Um, as he's, he's away. Um, but for today's webinar, I'd like to introduce, uh, we have four presenters from Massey University. Um, we have uh, Camille Manning, Jenny Green, Marla Burrow and Shelley van der Groot. And I'm going to hand straight across to them and they're going to tell you a little bit more about themselves and about their project. So over to you. Perfect. Thank you very, very much. Um, kia ora koto. I'm Marla Burrow from Massey University School of Nursing, uh, along with Camille Manning. And I think that we can, we may not be able to see each other until we all present. So you'll, you'll get to see all of us. We'll all be engaged in the presentation. But we have uh, on online with us today is uh, Camille Manning, Shelley Vandercroat, and Jenny Green. And we're really happy to have the opportunity to share our teacher teaching innovation um, with y'all. And it really was an innovation that was a result of a necessity. Um, but as the adage goes, necessity is the mother of invention. So um, I'd also like to mention, not able to be here with us today is uh, Caleb Finnegan, who was our technical support and our filming crew and whose secret identity is that of our School of Nursing Administrator in Wellington, and uh, Lockie Wow, who's Batman. So um, I was, it's, he is Batman, that is who he is. Um, uh, before we begin our discussion on the innovation, I will provide a bit of a backstory. Uh, the course in which this innovation is positioned is a core clinical nursing course where nursing assessment skills are introduced um, and the fundamental nursing skills such as communication and the very beginning of direct care skills um, that occurred in a course prior to this um, these skills are anchored into that then the this the the course that the innovation is in scaffolds into the long-term conditioned course where these assessment skills are then applied to abnormals and states of illness so it's a very it is a it's these courses are really important to the program and the nursing students that participate in them. Um, this course is a blended delivery course and has been delivered for a number of years in the first year of Bachelor of Nursing um, suite of courses. There are, I, I think we've tossed around 185 to 183. I know that's just an, an N of two in such a big group, but uh, over 180 nursing students were located over three distinct geographical regions in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So we have Palmerston North, uh, Wellington, and then also um, Albany, or Auckland, in the Auckland area, um, which is Albany. Um, and this, uh, this innovation that we'll be presenting is our response to the need to keep our students on track with their clinical learning but it ends up being in a very non-traditional space for the demonstration of clinical skill teaching. And so people think that the only real way to teach clinical skills is by using demonstration pedagogy and face-to-face -face, hands on teaching. And we have found that that is not entirely true. So um, I, will, I will hand this over to, I believe Shelly, are you on next? Camille. No, Camille. Camille. It's Camille. I will turn my video no, off. And... Um, so, so we had a challenge. Our challenge was that we needed to rapidly pivot this clinical assessment nursing course into an engaging um, online course which supported the development of these clinical skills that Marla is talking about. And that also um, incorporated social group dynamics because that was something that we were missing with everyone being in the online zone rather than in the classroom. 
And so this course has been um, delivered in a hybrid learning environment for three years. It had um, an existing stable online component which the students used for pre-learning. And, and we weren't able to deliver that synchronous tutorial that bridges between the pre-learning and the applied setting in the clinical labs um, where they could practice it all. And so instead of offering um, individual campus-based um, deliveries, we went for a full cohort, 180-something students, um, which would um, benefit from a team teaching perspective. And it, it leveraged off our um, clinical specialty knowledge as a group. So Batman um, evolved from uh, a phone conversation that we were having when we were solving the world's problems. And the idea of a STIG was, um, was floated. And we sort of, we latched onto the idea and it morphed into Batman because we had three masks that were available to us to use. So we had, Spider-Man, Captain America, and Batman. And our Stig was offered those three masks and he chose Batman. And, and Batman accidentally um, owed himself to the situation really, really well because he came with a backstory that the students all knew, they were all familiar with him. Um, he had uh, the character of Alfred, which Caleb took on the, the Alfred character on the online zone. That's what he'd label his computer as. Um, Batman didn't have genetic predispositions to anything because his parents had died too early. Uh, we all knew that he was fit and healthy and active. We knew his job description. And so we had a really good backstory to launch all our subjective health questions off. Um, as teachers, we all knew the the course content really well we all had experience in the demonstrative pedagogy of teaching that stuff um, we were quite familiar with zoom by this stage because we'd been using zoom in an earlier um, semester and we were at the stage where we could actually troubleshoot and flex with the tool um, on the fly as we were going and we had a stable team teaching environment um, we're all quite non-confrontational, we're all really accepting of each other, um, we all respect what we bring to the table as, as individuals and as a group, and we have a general vibe of it's all going to be okay. And so we'd worked out that we needed a stig, which turned into Batman, and from there we needed to work out how to actually get Batman into the the students' screens. And so Shelley's going to share with you the joys of setting up the video cameras. Yeah, so kia ora. Um, we, yeah, we, we, as Camille said, we'd got so far and then we needed to figure out how we were actually going to live stream, how were we going to get these images of Batman out to the students. And our first, first thought was um, in Wellington where I teach, we just had a uh, refurbishment of our lab. Um, and so we, we had cameras in place over bed spaces and we thought, well, let's let's use that. This would be fantastic the first time we get to use it. And we came up against a bit of a roadblock that we couldn't live stream from those cameras that were fixed. So we then turned our attentions to add some body cams and it's, it's the same ones actually that the police wear. And so we thought, well, surely those can live stream and we'll be able to use that. Got all really excited about it um, and to find we weren't able to live stream from those either. So we banded about as a team and we thought actually maybe if people have got GoPros at home, we could go use GoPros, we could have them um, attached to me and with diff different angles. But uh, once again, we had another roadblock. But the beauty is, as Camille's already talked about, is our team is very much, we can do this. Um, so we chatted a bit more and, and, and enter stage left, you know, Caleb, who's wonderful admin, you can see there on the screen, a little arrow. Um, and he's like, well, let's work with what we've got and what do we have? And we recognised we had laptops that we'd been using, we had webcams, um, and we actually had a couple of tripods. And so the the live streaming became through just a laptop and three webcams that we could move around using um, two tripods. And we also um, had one that we hung over the nursing lab, the rail, so we could have ab cam from the top. Um, so that was that was how the setup for live streaming was, um, and then we had to find Batman basically. Um, so um, we we Jenny, if you want to go to the the next slide, um, 
Oh, actually, that's you, isn't it? I was going to keep talking, Jenny. <laughs> do you want to come to that then later, or do you want to? I will come to that later. Yep. Okay. All good. Cool. Okay. So, um, in preparation for our students uh, for the semester starting, we knew that they had heightened anxiety. Um, there had been various levels of lockdown. It was um, potentially stressful for them, and so we wanted to uh, have a happy hour the week before the semester started. Um, and we said, bring a beverage of your choice. Now they're all adults, so um, we had beverages of our choice too. And um, we ran this happy hour and we began with a shared screen. So a bit like what we had at the beginning of this session, it was middle of the year, so we had a winter scene and we said to them, uh, tell us, draw on the screen or give us an idea what your ideal winter holiday would be. And there was all sorts of chaos happening on our, our shared screen while students were unobtrusively really getting used to the annotation tools. Um, and we were guiding them to where things were and how they could do it. And the purpose of this happy hour um, was to address some of the social needs that they would have. It was to create a convivial atmosphere. Um, it also gave us a chance to check out if they had any technical skills uh, that were going to be challenging um, within the Zoom environment. Um, and if there were connectivity things or things, we had a few days to nut out how we might help them if there were any technical or connection issues for them. So troubleshooting before we actually started the teaching, which would be using this environment and the platform was Zoom. And then um, within this hybrid learning environment, there's an ecology of elements that you can see. This screen is, uh, I was just, well, I was just going to see if it's going to work here. Will be. Yes. Um, this ACAD framework or activity centered analysis and design framework um, provides this ecology of elements, these three things of set design, social design, and epistemic design. And this was is evident in how we have put together or how this course came about and what we've done. So in terms of social design, we're thinking about how the students are socially situated. And in our environment, uh, this was either individually at home, um, but we also created uh, opportunities for social engagement by way of the drawing together, using the chat function, um, using the audio function to ask questions within the session. And we also went out to a polling site called Poll Everywhere, where students could see live everyone else's engagement with the poll. Then in terms of set design, this includes the tools and resources that are used within the environment. And we were acutely aware of the importance of using technology to promote connections and collaboration and participation. So we included opportunities to scaffold the learners into using the various technology tools that we were using, starting off with that happy hour. Um, we needed to consider too that students and staff were joining from home and often they may have flatmates that, that are there in the same space, uh, particularly uh, students and, and teachers with children who were perhaps homeschooling because of lockdown. You know, there were family members that often wanted to get in, involved in what was going on. So we didn't require people to have their cameras on. We were respectful of them choosing when they wanted to have their cameras on. And at times we muted people if there was uh, background noises um, in the space. In terms of epistemic design, this focuses on the learning content and how the knowledge is organised and disseminated. And um, as mentioned earlier, we had a stable learning environment of SCORM resources that we've used for the past three years. So these were the pre-learning activities that students engaged with that gave them the baseline content that they were going to need once they came into our synchronous class environment. And then we built on that in these live stream sessions. The ACAD um, framework identifies in the centre here the resulting emergent activity when these three design elements coalesce. And it recognises that learning occurs within and also continues outside of the classroom teaching space. And this concept is, was underpinned by the use of Batman along with activities that demonstrated the skills that students would need later on when they got to their clinical placements. And it all occurred in an environment that was enjoyable, it was injected with much humour, and had re a real practical purpose and application.
Um, so um, once, yeah, um, we needed we needed a Batman basically, and so um, I, uh, I took it upon myself uh, to find someone who wouldn't mind. Um, who wouldn't mind basically being having parts of their body exposed in front of you know 180 plus um, nursing students? So I thought to myself, who in the university did I know who was body proud and wouldn't mind? Uh, and so my mind went to the uh, gym, um, and I had a few connections there already. So I walked down to the gym and I floated this idea to them about having being a live mannequin. Um, and as we talked about before, it was I floated it as a stig, and and um, and then we ended up with Batman because that's who Lockie, who's um, Batman. Um, he chose that mask. So um, what I wanted to do, what we wanted to do was find find someone who could um, who could help me bring a sense of, of 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 levity and fun to the to the classroom. And Lockie was perfect for that. He was very much open to you can do whatever you want. I'll play along, and that was sort of key to. Um, creating a uh, classroom where the students felt comfortable and I felt comfortable and that just kind of flowed over um, with Lockie. So my, um, one of uh, my sort of teaching ethos is about humour and using humour and as a team we were all really keen to have that in the classroom because we've talked about wanting to create a space where students felt a connection. So they felt a connection to um, the character, they felt a connection to each other because through the chat function, they could make smart comments about sequels and Batman. Um, and so that enabled us to really have a connection that we've never had before. And as Marla said, these, these three um, uh, campuses have never really come together before. So using humour, using Batman, we were able to create an environment that was relaxed, that helped students to connect with each other, that helped us as as teachers to connect. Um, and yeah, it was it was it was a wonderful wonderful um, discovery of how we could put this put this class online. Um, yeah, it was it was really fantastic um, to to have Lockie as Batman um, and play along with us in the humour. So, how did it all work? Um, it worked really well. It looked amazingly well because we got all of the teachers and all the people involved played to their strengths. So we had Lockie who didn't mind getting his clothes off in front of people and playing along. He was very relaxed. We had Marla who had this wonderful big picture and she was our moderator who was able to keep us all on track, especially me when I got a little bit off, off, um, off on a tangent, she'd bring us back. Um, we had Jenny, who you've already seen, who has amazing skills at all these different platforms and was seamlessly able to bring PowerPoint to poll everywhere to you name what we needed. She had it on the screen and it just worked beautifully. We had Camille, who was on the chat. She was she is um, got amazing knowledge. She was able to answer the questions as soon as they came in. She created some amazing PowerPoints that were very logical. They were fun. They had a Batman symbol. Um, and, and, and all of those things combined, I knew that I had this amazing team that had my back, that when I was doing the probably the easiest part, I was doing the talking and interacting with Batman. I knew that if I stumbled, I knew that if I had a gap and I stumbled a lot, they would feel, they would they would back me up. They'd have my back and it was wonderful. We had Caleb, who we've talked about, who was able to help with these the camera angles. He was able to seamlessly move from, a, say, a front view and an anterior view to a posterior view to a side view. And as we talked about the ab cam, which was hanging off a rail, he could do that. And the amazing thing was, is that he wasn't always in the room with us. He sometimes yeah, was in his own home or even another city at one point. So he brought those skills to make the seamless um, um, teaching environment just work. And because we were having fun with it, because we knew that we had such great skills all combined, it just made for an amazing, relaxed atmosphere. Um, and every now and again, I'd throw in something like walking into a curtain just for good measure. Um, so that it worked, it worked beautifully well. Jenny? It is. I think it's me. Um, so while as a team, uh, individually, we all had um, a, a degree of technical aptitude. We knew the course and the content, and we were all experienced 
in um, demonstration pedagogy. So we knew the, the flow and the rhythm that Shelley was, um, which, which she was demonstrating. Um, it was still a very experimental space. And it, we were, we did not want to risk um, excluding anybody um, at the risk of trying to, in this very exper experimental place, we have n never brought this many people together. Um, so during the course delivery, um, we used various reports that were generated by the online conferencing um, software. And, um, and so, and, and also the external video platforms that we use to download the, um, the, uh, the recordings onto. And so what we were allowed to do it, is it allowed us to see the engagement. Now, we weren't checking the stats for engagement, like a participation score or anything like that. We were actually looking at it uh, to um, pick up access issues. Uh, we had students who were, may have not had access to reliable internet. They, many of the students were trying to um, participate on smartphones. Um, we had students that may not have had any, any, any devices. I know we had to provide um, um, some devices to students who did not actually have um, um, the technology to engage with online courses. And keep in mind that we're all online now. It's not just this particular course, but all of their courses. So by using these, these the, the full breadth of the conference software and the um, video platforms, we're able to sort of get a, a clue as to how things were going. And if we got worried about somebody, one of the campus teachers would um, uh, engage with that particular student to see if there was, they were okay, um, and to see if there was anything that we could provide. Because going back to the ACAD, it's that, that social component along with the environment. These were, this is what was making it work. Um, and we definitely didn't want to lose anybody um, in, in this particular instance. So we did that for the first three sessions um, and everything seemed to be fine. In fact, it was so fine that we had about 80% of 80% uh, participation for all the classes. There was 10, this was 10 weeks of classes. And I don't know if y'all taught, and any of y'all taught, but for us to have 80% of people engaged with chats flying and um, thing, people drawing and doing things, that was pretty phenomenal for us. And then um, the online recorded content was viewed, you know, we would have things that were viewed 60 times, which was also quite phenomenal for us. So it worked really, really well. Um, we had, um, the students really picked up on this quickly. And um, it, not only did we know each other's strengths, but we also knew each other's weaknesses, so we wouldn't position each other into places that we may not, may not be able to survive well. So um, I think that, it, what this demonstrates is a level of complexity and scale that I don't, I, I don't believe any of us believe we could have done this as an individual and that it took each one of us um, and, and our skills to actually pull something off at this scale. Um, so that was a bit of, of, of what happened in the background that people weren't really, that we were doing to make sure everything was, was going and, and staying on point. I think. Oh, I'm doing that. That's me too. <laughs> so, so um, the COVID-19 pandemic resulted in really significant uncertainty for students, their Fownal families, and it's com it completely transformed the learning context. Um, we became mindful of the imperative to maintain the teaching and learning uh, environment. We were considerate of personal safety. Um, the emotional well-being of our students and our colleagues. And this was a time where our students and colleagues had been thrust into social isolation with, um, and there was, there was personal and professional disruptions, um, live, the, so the, the, the incorporation of live video tutorials, that live stream provided a real connection with our superhero. Um, the texting, 
And not only did we get questions about our courses, but Camille was answering questions about other things going on um, and allowed them a space where they knew that a live person that was one of their teachers was going to be available to them. Uh, so that was that really made a big difference to a lot of students. Because um, Camille and Shelley had come off of this, they were teaching in semester one where they had about four weeks before the first lockdown, and they learned what um, they did not want to risk that level of disruption, and they didn't want to leave these students behind because these students would be going into a very large clinical placement once uh, we were able to step out of, of our lockdown situation. So our response to the Rapid Pivot Online was to create a pedagogically sound tech, uh, teaching environment that included the consideration for students' technical needs in order to access and participate in online learning. And this approach allowed for a flexible and responsive pattern of course engagement um, and, and increased the accessibility to our students um, who were facing significant um, social and environmental challenges. Um, it was a highly dynamic environment that was required to be nimble, but it was also low cost and easily accessible. Um, the teaching pedagogy, the fact that it aligned with our technology was a what, did I forget something? No. Oh, I heard laughing, so I was like, oh, what have I done? No. Oh, that's all good. Uh, do you want me to okay, I'll keep going. I'll just prattle on. Um, so, um, the points. So we facilitated a learning environment that was ho that holistically addressed a participant needs through a thoughtfully created learning experience. We had a webcam-based solution to live streaming, which was low cost and easily accessible. And this allowed us to continue with our synchronous teaching that we would normally do in lab, only in an online environment. Uh, the use of a superhero, uh, within the online classroom was a highly effective way to ensure that the cohorts and the, uh, the, the cohort of students felt that um, they were there and they all had a shared understanding of what was going on when they stepped in. So that was socially, that was a really good thing. Um, we were not aiming for perfection and uh, we wanted something functional flexible, fun, realistic to meet the students learning needs. Now the rapid pivot also, there were some non-negotiables that we had to had to establish. We did not want to be confrontational. We did not want to be super vigilant, setting on what we try, like trying to enforce something or create a, a copy of uh, the face-to-face -face sessions. Uh, we changed everybody's timetable to align with for a synchronous session. So that got all 180 plus students in that space. Um, and we took considerable risks, but we didn't try to over-engineer it. And um, uh, we, we kept the content to an appropriate scale. So that allowed for a space for that, those amazing uh, student engagement and interaction with Shelly and Camille and everybody on there to um, actually eventuate. So it was, it was very, I think we felt it was really successful. And I really hope that there was some part of this innovation that y'all have found relevant to your deliveries. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Jenny to kick off the discussion, which I believe is next. Is Jenny still there? Oh, you're on mute. Hi, but yeah, it just went, it mutes itself by, for some strange reason. Um, just to, before we go on to the next slide, we used um, in one session um, a yoga um, person from the university to come in and take a half hour or three quarter hour yoga session for students prior to the class starting, which went down really well. And we also used these emojis for people to indicate how they were and um, just as a way of acknowledging how tough it was at times for students and staff. Um, yes, yeah, so as we head into a time of discussion, you know, our, um, it was essential that our hybrid learning design position students to be able to practice uh, within the psychology of elements that we used in the environment. And we gave consideration to students being active learners. Uh, you, we used humour and chat and the polls and the discussion audio function to enable that to happen. And we believe that this worked particularly well with this type of pedagogy because we were already used to it within the course 
and we were able to pivot it into the online because of the kind of elements that we've already said about experience and willing to risk things and just have it a go and trust each other's uh, expertise. So yes, just if there's any questions, we'd be really happy to take any. So feel free to pop them in the chat or just to unmute yourselves and, and we're happy to answer. Miguel. Hello, I'm, I'm Miguel Iglesias. I'm from the University of Tasmania. I actually have two questions. So I don't teach clinical skills. I actually teach the bioscience to nurses. But I've, I've got one curiosity. What I, I see what you've done is, is great. But I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more one activity of the ones that you did. For example, I saw that you had one slide there. Um, talking about the location of the apex of the heart. So did you have yeah. one person using your volunteer, using Batman and locating it, or how did you go about that? So a bit more specific on one of the activities, that would be I'll, great. I'll, I'll let, so it was, the way this course was designed, it had a stable online environment, so they got the background for um, the anatomy and physiology. So they were showing up, they had the opportunity to get the language and to see the theory. And then I'll hand it over to Shelly because she'll talk about how she actually demonstrated that for the camera. Yeah. Um, so we have, um, in, in all of the labs, we have what we call a lab workflow sheet, which goes through all of the assessments they need to do. And so you're quite right that I would talk about that, yeah, we were going to find the apex of the heart. And then I actually had eyeliner, so I could draw on Batman. And then I would show them finding the sternal notch, the angle of Louis, counting down the intercostal spaces to the fifth intercostal space, and then moving across to the midclavicular line and marking it. So they could see it on a real person um, as I talked about the landmarks um, how I would do it and how yeah we could find it so we did that we ran through all the body systems and they yeah they watched um, and then they and, the, and I always encouraged interaction too so that when I was doing it I said how did that could you see that um, do you want me to do that again yeah that kind of thing so that they were able to see it real time ask questions but we were using all of the landmarks and that's why we thought a real person would be fantastic because actually they could see how in a way how hard you had to press um you know to, to actually find the intercostal spaces and where a midclavicular line was yeah was that helpful is that yeah yeah very much so i can see how students would benefit from that did they were they encouraged to then practice on for example the uh, family yeah <laughs> Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Yep, no, we absolutely said, yep, any, any willing volunteer in your bubble <laughs> at that time, <laughs> go for it. Yeah, and we even, like, when we were talking, when we talk about cardiac and even just listening to hearts and things, we said, look, if you happen to be home alone and you've got a pet, try it and do it on your pet, you know, like, so we, we tried to work with them, but absolutely we encouraged them to do it on themselves or any willing volunteers nearby until they got the opportunity to come into the lab and do it, yeah. Thank you. My other question is about how scalable do you think this is? Because we are in the fortunate, and I say fortunate inverted commas, uh, position of having 830 students across four campuses and two states. So I'm actually based on Sydney. I'm in lockdown right at the moment, uh, but I'm still teaching to students in Tasmania in three locations in Tasmania plus R1 here. And um, if you were encountering this number, from your experience, what would you do? Would you break them into rooms? Would you? No, I, I wouldn't. So it, it, and this is where your pedagogy, the pedagogy that you're using um, is, is incredibly important and has to align with the technology that you have. Um, Ginny and I tried some amazing stuff that did not work as well as this and that it's because of trying to uh, ask too much of the technology um it, for us for a class that's amazing that's a huge class and i think you know the shelley's end would work really well you could do that in a demo using demonstration pedagogy but you would have to have a team of people ready for the chat what do you think jenny yeah, so I was thinking we contemplated using breakout rooms, but uh, the problem for that was um, 
if, this, if, we aren't, if we aren't able to visit the breakout room to kind of check if there's any misunderstandings or that kind of thing, then it was just delaying time going in and out. In terms of poll everywhere, I'm just going to go back to the slide that shows this one. So the, um, you can see the screen that the students are seeing on Batman. I would think that within your eight, class of 800, the chat function could work so long as, as Marla said, you've got enough staff to be able to be responding to that because it's going to go quite fast. Um, yeah. But then the poll everywhere on the right hand side of the screen here, that can cope up to 700 people um, with the account that we have, but you can get a greater number of people in the room. So that was that is a way that you could have all of those students engaging and gate like we use things like um, well how many you know how many people can guess the right thing here and then we discussed um, why there were plausible wrong answers that they may have chosen and why so we we were really mindful of not um, putting people down for choosing the wrong answer but it, but having a conversation about why we could understand people were choosing those wrong answers because it can be quite shameful otherwise. This was all anonymous too, um, but uh, so that was there. So yes, yeah, so I think chat polls could work. Definitely, the um, Shelley demonstrating on Batman with all that class watching would would totally work, I would think. Um, and if what we did was then call for who would who would like to um, ask Shelley or Batman a question, and they could just raise their hand, and then your moderator could go to them rather than it being a free for all of people unmuting. So I think potentially possible, but it would need a team approach. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome. Tracy, have we answered your question? I noticed you asked one before about an example. Okay, cool. Yeah, so any other thoughts or questions? I think even with Poll Everywhere, because that's an external package, it works, Poll Everywhere for me works really good in classes over 40, and Free Text does not work well in classes over 40, but Word Cloud works really well, and you have to design your questions really well, because otherwise it becomes overwhelming really fast. Mm. Well, there's Elaine. <laughs> I'll put my hands up as well. Um, I have a quick question. So, and you might have mentioned this, and apologies if you did, but after the lockdowns finished and, and the, the end of the pivot, did you continue with Batman? I mean, would you would you carry on? That is a great that? question. And I'm going to hand that over to um, Jenny and Camille and Shelley, who are doing just that. So, well, at the time, after the we after our first lockdown in April, May last year, we decided that we wanted to uh, sort of future-proof this course for the second semester, and which is why we planned it to deliver it like this. So, irrelevant of whether we were in or out of lockdown, the the stable platform of the course would continue. And so, um, for part of it. We were able to have face-to-face -face labs on most campuses, and then we went into complete lockdown, and we had no face-to-face -face at all. Just that, but this course just kept continuing with the Batman Online, and then some uh, restrictions were eased, and some campuses were able to do their labs, um, and others weren't. So there was all this combination of going all the way through. So um, maybe Camille or, or Shelley, do you want to pick up how we're doing it this for this semester that's about to start? Yeah, so for um, Batman 2021, um, we have taken the we've taken snippets of um, Shelley's demonstrations with Batman, um, broken it into the four kind of components of um, palpation, percussion, auscultation, and inspection. Not in that order, um, and have inserted it into our PowerPoint slides so that. They can have that uh, demonstration uh, in the classroom and and then we can stand there and we can have a live chat and a live conversation. And that's leveled up from what I used to do uh, 2018, 2019 was I used to take uh, a mannequin with me and a mannequin, it, it doesn't translate as well as uh, Batman's body does. 
so that's how we're going to use it in 2021. Great, thank you. Thanks for that. Does anyone else want to ask the team a question? I've got another one up my sleeve, but I wait for anyone else in the audience to just turn your mic on or I give you leave to ask, Elaine. Go ahead. <laughs> so I was interested in the um, back to one of the comments earlier about the whole um, t turn your camera on, turn your camera off. There's been wide debate over that. And it was interesting to hear you guys say that you totally left it up to your students and um, to see how it went. And I, I just wondered, it sounds like you built up a lot of trust and, you know, the introduction of the humour and you were really concerned about connecting with them. I wondered whether um, you saw a change in whether people were turning their cameras on over the course, you know, as that trust was built or as the... Um, the time went on or, or what do you, whether it didn't really make a difference? We saw a lot of chat traffic and um, uh, Jenny's got a really good story about that. Yeah, um, so um, one of the things that happened what in terms of humor, but I'll, I might just park that for a minute and, and Elaine, um, I can't recall whether there was increased camera on or off, but for us it actually wasn't that wasn't something that we were concerned about because we could see that they were engaging in different ways. And I think that's what Marla's alluding to with the chat traffic. Um, and we know that there are lurkers in, in online environments and lurkers are still learning. So, um, so that's an aspect to be mindful of. But in terms of the, what Marla was talking about, we had this situation where Shelley was demonstrating a, a, a heart, a, a cardiac, aspect on Batman and needed to raise the head of the bed on this electronic bed and she's um, getting the bed and rising up and it takes a wee while for the head to come up and as she's doing it in the chat one of the students types the dark knight rises and there's just this hilarity uh, going on in a serious moment you know of the class and they were gold you know th those are the kind of things that connect people um, but in, in terms of the cameras off, we were really mindful that some students were in a place where they did not want to expose what was going on behind them. Um, and that was important to respect that. So I guess it probably depends on the on the situation and the trust. Yeah. I remember that we actually asked the students one day, um, you know, what what's holding you back turning the cameras on or the cameras off and there was a lot of chat about I'm still in my PJs and and we embraced that we were like cool you're in your PJs and you're doing your study and you're learning about how to do a respiratory or a neurological assessment and if having your camera off makes you comfortable to do that then we can we'll fly with that that's how it works oh yeah PJs pajamas Fantastic, thank you. In my last session, I managed to get all the students, it was only 24, to open the video. Yeah. But I did not manage to get them to open the microphone and speak. It's interesting. I found this 20-something um, generation, they are too scared to speak in a, in a setting like that. So they were able to chat, and that's why I think that poll everywhere it's a great tool, but they do not open the microphone. Is that your experience as well? Um, yeah. Well, what we and what we, I think sometimes too, Miguel, it's important to um, uh, recognise that once we've asked a question, it takes people a bit of time to process the question, but it also takes them time to find the right bits on the keyboard or on the screen to unmute themselves or do the chat. So, I was I was quite mindful of. Uh, repeating the instructions throughout the session. Um, just remember, if you want to um, pop something in the chat, then one of us will make sure we answer it. And if you'd like to, to talk to her, talk to Shelley, ask your questions, hold the space bar down. It works a bit like a walkie-talkie. You just hold the space bar down, ask your question, and then Shelley can respond to you. So I basically was a cracked record quite mm -hmm. often through it. So it was reinforcing to them 
how they would go about it. Um, and there's all, there always seems to be some vocal students that are happy to talk, for us anyway. Yeah, so it is, um, the other thing that we did, and I've used when I've been teaching alone uh, online, is um, if you model casual conversation, then people will pick it up. So when we would begin our sessions, we were just talking to each other about all kinds of stuff. And we have sort of this beginning zone where people are coming in and we will verbally tell them, hello, how's it going? How are you doing? And people can choose to engage at that point. Um, but I've had my office mates uh, hop in and, you know, online so we could actually start that, that type of informal conversation. And that has sort of helped set the tone. We had music too. We, I, I used Spotify and I had that playing whenever we had a, you know, a break um, and ask people what playlist they want and we kind of had a class playlist for a while. So I think dear to ear is, is uncomfortable for people. So if there is some kind of just natural chatter or something going on, uh, even just chat traffic, um, it helps to create that environment that's a safe space to be and welcoming. Thank you, very helpful tips. I'll try next time. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks for your questions. And, and don't forget, Miguel, not everyone, not everyone speaks in the classroom, in the physical classroom setting either. And mm -hmm. so, you know, a, an X amount of percentage will speak in the classroom and an X percent will speak in the online kind of zone as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of that, but it's interesting when I put them in breakout rooms, they still don't talk to each other. They're happy to talk. Yeah, there's a little bit but, of that. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, but it's not that they don't have the answer. It's that they don't want to verbalize it. They type it, but they don't speak it. So but anyway, uh, no, like, they're, they are. It's our text generation. This, this is where things like pull everywhere. So you give mm -hmm. the group a task, a question to answer. And then, so they actually have to do something in that space. Otherwise, they're just going to, I mean, it's a great place to talk, but if you're asking them to engage with a particular type of, of activity, it's sort of like proof of life. You want to know they've done something? Yeah, so what we've sometimes done is, is put the students, not in this course, but in another one, put them into a breakout room with specific directions about what we want them to talk about. And then in their breakout room, they're using their phone to, uh, to put something on our poll so that when they come out of the breakout room, they see on our poll site what everybody else thinks about it. And then we have the discussion. Yeah. Fantastic. So did they give you suggestions about what to do with Batman? I don't did know. Did, uh, everybody loved Batman. Yeah, they um, when it when it came to sort of suggestions, they we had a revision session at the end, and they asked about the things they wanted to go over. So I primed Batman beforehand. I said, "This is going to be potentially a free for all. It's whatever they want, <laughs> we'll do." Um, and that was kind of uh, yeah, that was kind of good fun. But they'd certainly during the classes, if there was something that they that they missed or they wanted a different sort of view of that they'd let us know and they'd say can you do that again and then I'd quite happily do whatever assessment um, again or a small part of it so yeah they did. Great. Do we have any further questions for our presenters today? Did we catch everything from the chat? Yeah, I think we did. So, uh, you know, we're all easily easy to find through the Massey University website, and we're happy to answer any questions or talk to you about how we've done things. So always, please don't hesitate to contact us if you want to. Absolutely. You're welcome, um, okay. Well, if there is no further questions, then I will... Um, wrap it up um, and thank everybody, especially our presenters today, um, Marla, um, Jenny, Camille, Shelley, um, for sharing their very innovative um, practices with us. And on behalf of Askel, I'd like to thank um, the participants as well for attending and um, remind everybody that uh, submissions for the Askelite conference 
our G uh, submission deadline's been extended to the 16th of July, so um, please uh, do um, submit and we'll hope to see everybody at the conference and certainly at the next um, Ask a Light Live webinar. So thank you, everybody. It was wonderful to he hear from you. Thanks, Elaine. Thank you. Thank you.